This is a pair of $59,000 headphones. They're known as the HE1s by Sennheiser, and they are the most expensive headphones in the world. But these are Beats by Dre. Hello? What up, Dre? Few brands have risen to the top of American pop culture as quickly or as thoroughly as Beats did in the late 2000s. Beats by Dre had a novel idea. Use the principle of hype culture to sell headphones. That strategy turned over-the-ear headphones from a niche product to a cultural phenomenon. Here's how Beats leveraged the strategies of sneaker culture to become one of the most recognizable brands in the world. This is Suddenly Obsessed. Before the Sony Walkman debuted in 1979, headphones were mainly a utility used by the military and professional sound engineers. And that's pretty much where consumer headphone technology stayed until October 23rd, 2001. And we are introducing a product today called iPod. You can take your whole music library with you right in your pocket. Now, to be fair, there were other MP3 players on the market at the time, but the $399 classic iPod and those white earbuds became a sort of status symbol. People had these white headphones everywhere. It was on the sides of buses and subway stations, on TV commercials. And sort of everybody needed these white headphones that showed you had an iPod. Sales took off. but. Audiophiles were unimpressed. The bass was non-existent, the mid-range was muddled, they let in a lot of outside noise, and they were uncomfortable to wear. It seemed Apple and its competitors were more focused on the functionality of the MP3 player rather than the sound quality of the earbuds, creating an opportunity for a higher quality headphone. Everything suddenly came with cheap headphones. And they decided, oh, we'll just make headphones a part of every piece of technology. And what happened was the audio experience went like this, but what was great about the world of digital recording is we were just doing more and more interesting things in the studio, but the sound was getting tiny. In October 2003, Interscope co-founder Jimmy Iovine reached out to Luke Wood, the chief strategy officer at Interscope Geffen A&M. Iovine wanted to discuss the state of the music industry. Wood made a name for himself throughout the industry, working with famous bands like Nirvana, Weezer, and the Yeah Yeah Yeahs. But still, he admits he was intimidated to talk one-on-one -on -one with Iovine. I was pretty much terrified is an understatement because I loved my job. I had the greatest job in the world. I made rock records for a living. And I was like, oh, here's the biggest guy in hip hop. Now, yeah, he made Patti Smith and he worked with Bruce Springsteen and John Lennon, but now he's pretty much known as the hip hop guy. And I don't know if he's gonna have any time for me. Iovine was interested in Wood's take on music piracy. Instead, they got into a discussion about music production. Headphones never came up. First thing he did is play me the records you're working on. I played him a record, got to, the, to basically the bridge of the song, and he immediately pinpointed the problem. It was super technical. In that conversation, towards the end of that breakfast, he started saying, what are we gonna do about piracy? How are we gonna fix the business? And you know, he found a kindred spirit in myself as another entrepreneur, like, how do we take this on? How do we go after it? In 2006, Iovine called one and told him that he and Dr. Dre were building a headphone company. That one seemed super absurd to me because I wasn't afraid to go do jeans or sunglasses or something interesting like that because that's like a new space and you know we can find people who are experts. But suddenly if we're doing something in audio, that's what we did. We had to pull that out of ourselves. Beats by Dre was born. Wood says there were two key issues the company was solving for the lost revenue from digital music, and the poor sound quality from the headphones that were out at the time. Beats partnered with Monster Inc. to develop its first pair of headphones. On July 25, 2008, Beats by Dre dropped the Monster Beats, which carried a price tag of $350. We had no idea how big the opportunity was, but what we knew was the headphone space pretty much had been treated like stuff that sold at Office Depot. Gray, solving a utilitarian problem. That made no sense because the headphone was like an Air Jordan. It wasn't a stapler. So for us, it was like, how do we bring fashion, design, iconography, energy, and then underneath that bring sound and innovation? That was the opportunity. And so Beats would launch different colors for sports teams or different sizes and things that attracted people to not just headphones, but the actual look of the headphones themselves. It was itself a fashion accessory, whether they sounded good or not. Celebrities and athletes were clamoring to get their hands on a pair but Wood points to one specific moment in Beats history that made the over-the-ear headphones go viral. We had this amazing thing happen in 2008 around the Beijing Olympics. LeBron James was in Jimmy Iovine's office. They were working on a documentary, and he casually mentions, he and his manager, Maverick Carter, that they're gonna go to Beijing. Could he get a pair of headphones? And then LeBron says, can I get 12 to give out to the team? We gave him 12 pair of headphones. 
That seems small now, but for Beats, that was iconic. Just like the latest pair of Air Jordans, everybody wanted them. Often we would basically say that these are sneakers on your head, and that's kind of how we looked at it, because sneakers were so much about identity. We had the other piece of it in that we, we really want to bring in great technology and innovation. It's that thing that says to the world, who are you part of? What community are you part of? Who do you want to be? Who's your tribe? That's what a headphone can be. As Beats grew in popularity, more and more celebrities started attaching themselves to the brand. You'd see them during warm-ups at NFL games, NBA games, and before tennis matches. In February 2011, Iovine and Dre officially named Wood president and COO of Beats. In August of that year, Beats inked a $309 million deal with HTC for a 50.1% stake in the company, granting HTC exclusive rights to manufacture smartphones with Beats-branded audio. Beats would later buy back its shares. Beats released their first Bluetooth headphones in October 2011, called the Beats by Dre Wireless, priced at $279.95. By the end of 2011, Beats had a 53% market share. But even with mixed reviews, sales continued to rise. I think Beats was able to charge a lot because they wanted to market it as a premium product that people had to pay for, whether the technology was there or not. In some cases it was. I know producers did like Beats, their high-end versions, but the ones consumers were buying were often pretty similar to what you could buy for a lot less, just without the Beats logo. In July 2012, Beats acquired MOG Music Service for $14 million. That same year in October, Beats unveiled its first pair of active noise-canceling headphones, the Beats Executives. Beats uses two noise-canceling technologies, passive noise isolation, which essentially blocks ambient sound through physical barriers, like extra padding around the ear cup, and active noise cancellation, which reduces ambient sound digitally. Microphones located inside and outside of the headphones gauge the amount of ambient sound around you and play at a specific frequency level to cancel out the noise pollution. Other companies like Bose, Sony, and Panasonic offered comparable technology at a similar price point. But Beats had one thing they didn't. Well, two. Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. The buzz generated by a string of successes caught the attention of investors. In September 2013, Beats received a $500 million investment from the Carlyle Group, bringing its value to a reported $1 billion, a number it would triple in less than a year. Do you have a pair? I, I don't. We have Our many have pairs, yeah. Pairs. There yep. you go. That's great. In January 2014, Beats launched a streaming service called Beats Music, which boasted better sound quality than Spotify and other streaming services. It offered music recommendations based on users' listening habits. As a result, MOG was shut down later that year. By March 2014, Beats had a reported 57% of the, quote, premium headphone market. Apple is in talks to buy the headphone maker Beats Electronics, and that would be Apple's biggest acquisition. But moments before the official announcement, Dr. Dre and Tyrese Gibson went on Facebook to prematurely spread the news. Oh my! The first billionaire in hip hop right here from the West Coast, believe it. Oh, oh. The stunt did not go over well. Nevertheless, on August 1st, 2014, Apple acquired Beats Electronics and Beats Music for $3 billion. They basically own this market, and so Apple is buying entree. Now, is Jimmy Iovine going to be great for the streaming side? Is Dr. Dre's endorsement going to help? Is it about the music business solely, or is this a toe dip into fashion apparel industry? And you, I know that sounds crazy. People wear these as a fashion statement. This is about getting into the streaming music market. Three months later, Apple folded Beats streaming service into Apple Music. However, Apple's release of the iPhone 7 in 2016 might have unwittingly helped Beats gain an even larger share of the headphone market. The theorists arguing that this headphone jack uh, removal is not just to make the phone thinner, but also to create an environment in which Beats wireless headphones really become a much larger part of the equation. Well, I mean, this is that whole that Apple's getting smarter about taking advantage of its ecosystem to make a profit. That same month, Beats released the Solo 3 Wireless and Powerbeats 3, which used Apple's W1 chip, allowing their headphones to immediately pair with an iPhone and extend its battery life. This marked the first time Beats incorporated Apple's tech into its product design. In September 2017, Beats released the Studio 3 line, and in October 2019, it released the Solo Pro, which used Apple's H1 chip. But as Beats grew, it began facing a string of lawsuits. In 2014, the company was sued by the Bose Corporation. The case was settled out of court for an undisclosed sum of money. In January of 2015, Monster Inc. sued Beats, saying it fraudulently ended its relationship with the company. But the case was dismissed. 
And in 2018, a jury awarded former hedge fund executive Stephen Lamar $25.25 million for his involvement in the design of the headphones. Now, Beats is facing a more fundamental problem, changing consumer preferences. When Apple got rid of the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack with the release of the iPhone 7, it was laying the groundwork for a new line of Bluetooth high fidelity earbuds, the AirPods. These are little baby wireless earphones that are basically the size of a cufflink. They will operate through a wireless chip and they will have to be charged separately. Apple's gonna provide a charger, but you're gonna have to pay for them. They'll cost about $159. This is Apple's second foray into wearables. This is a winner here. AirPods are a runaway success and we're making them just as fast as we can. In 2018, the AirPods were Apple's most popular accessory with 35 million units sold. In 2019, that number ballooned to nearly 60 million, equal to about $6 billion in revenue. Apple has since released an even more expensive version called the AirPods Pro and is expected to release additional versions later in 2020. Apple's current lock on the earbud market is putting Beats in unfamiliar territory, playing catch up. In May 2019, Beats released a high-end line of in-ear true wireless earbuds called PowerBeats Pro to directly compete with the AirPods. But it may be too little too late. Analysts estimated AirPods made up 71% of the global wireless headphone market in 2019. Even more concerning for Beats, Apple is expected to release a pair of over-the-ear headphones during rumors that the company could kill off the Beats brand entirely. And legacy brands like Shure and Sennheiser are also looking to take advantage of the recent surge in popularity of over-the-ear headphones. For us, it is absolutely about audio, and our challenge is what else, how else can we build up Durability is a big one, meaning um, I ought to be able to throw this headphone in a backpack and not worry it's going to break. Same thing with an earphone. Sennheiser has been around for 75 years, so in order to remain relevant, we really focus on the customer who understands audio and who wants more than just noise. The impact Beats had on pop culture is undeniable. In eight years, Dre, Iovine and Wood built one of the most recognizable brands in the world. But even with its massive success and popularity, the future of Beats remains uncertain. I don't think that Beats legacy has personally been written yet, because as long as people are making music, we have a right and a responsibility and an opportunity to create a playback device to honor that music. Music has been around for thousands of years, and the more and more you feel disconnected from the world, the more you want to connect to something yourself. When Apple purchased Beats, it didn't just buy the company, it bought its cultural cachet. But in August 2018, Jimmy Iovine stepped down into a consulting role, leaving Beats' future with Apple a little less certain. He told The Times in December 2019, quote, when I went to Apple, it was a new creative problem for me. How do we make this the future of the music business? I ran out of personal runway. Somebody else will have to do that. So the big question remains, is there room for two premium headphone brands at Apple? Only time will tell.